So I thought I would just do, Deborah asked me y'all to do kind of a short intro on like the origins of the project, um, a little bit about the Underground Railroad and then leave time for questions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're trying to respect everyone's time because I know that y'all were kind of transitioning out of a lot of meetings and stuff there. Um, but yeah, the Underground Railroad Project, you know, as you know from transcribing it, and it's a remarkable group of interviews. Um, the scholarship is on the Underground Railroad is has become international. Um, you know, in the since I was in graduate school, uh, it's really focusing now not just on the U.S. based aspect of the Underground Railroad but the ways in which um, it has an international impact, routes, origins, destinations. Um, this also gets us into our initial uh, work with the National Park Service, as Deborah can share. Uh, and uh, Ronan and Juanita, I don't know if you, you have seen any of the older interviews that we did with the Park Service. Uh, Deborah, back, I think, in 2011 or 12. 12, well, yeah. We were invited by the National Park Service to uh, their summer um, conference. And the emphasis on that summer conference was the Underground Railroad in an international context, especially in the global South. So freedom seekers and conductors who weren't just like in New York or Canada or Wisconsin, but were in Mexico, we're in the Bahamas, we're in Martinique, uh, and other, and, and in Florida too, as because many African American enslaved people were able to escape through Florida uh, into the Bahamas, into the Caribbean, uh, into Haiti, uh, and other other places. Uh, and so, in that series of interviews, Deborah, I think that Marna Weston and I, and and Ryan, and maybe Justin Donovan. Um, travel just to St. Augustine, and we interviewed a number of descendants um, of the Freedom Seekers people, but it, that trip was heavily focused on the Second Seminole War, and the, the in other words, the, the alliance between uh, Seminole and Creek Indians and uh, escaped African American slaves who tried to stop the U.S. from pushing slavery further into Florida. And so you know that three wars were fought between this alliance against the United States of America. And uh, for many decades, these were the most expensive wars in America, US American history. Uh, the Seminoles never were really defeated per se, but they evacuated and retreated uh, first from a line uh, roughly uh, parallel to the Apalachicola River, all the way down south of Tampa. And archaeologists now are finding, are still finding new maroon communities uh, south of Tampa, where people escaped and, and lived in relative freedom from the United States. So the history of the Underground Railroad is just, is really amazing. Scholars are now kind of, um, arguing that the, the Underground Railroad was decisive uh, in terms of both bringing an element of democracy to U.S. politics that did not exist, um, but that also was was a key factor to uh, the, the, the Civil War because the U.S. passed a number of Fugitive Slave Acts uh, and Robert Seeley, in one of the first interviews that we did, uh, actually, I think the first interview we did in this new generation of Underground Railroad interviews, Robert Seeley talks about this, that the main goal of the U.S. Supreme Court was, in many ways, to shut down the Underground Railroad and to stop um, escaped slaves from leaving the South, because this, is, this was the number one issue that ends up being, you know, causing really the American Civil War. Uh, is the failure of the South to police its own borders and to keep captive labor uh, from fleeing to Mexico, from fleeing to Canada, from fleeing to the Bahamas, et cetera, et cetera. So from a scholarship perspective, this collection is, um, to me right now, this is the most important oral history project that I can imagine happening in this country. It's just 
I, I cannot overemphasize the importance of it. But transitioning to the interviews themselves, and then I want to open it up for questions. Um, I just want to offer some observations on the interviews we've done so far uh, to let you know um, I'm happy to continue working with y'all as, as a consultant or however you want me to, whatever role you want me to play. There is a project in Cornell right now that's being directed by my colleague, Ed Baptist, who's really an amazing historian of, of, of racial capitalism and slavery. And Ed has received a major grant to digitize um, announcements, kind of contemporary announcements in the 1830s, 1840s, 1850s um, of, of runaway slaves. So there's a lot I could see, you know, kind of these projects working together in some ways. Um, the interviews so far, I think, have been, uh, they've been challenging uh, because people are challenging, right? People come to these interviews with different agendas, different hopes, different wishes. And I think of the, the there's a contrast between our interviews with people like Peggy Priestley. I still think the Peggy Priestley interview, Ronan uh, and, and Juanita, is really um, a model interview um, that I hope that as, as new people come into the project, we, we make sure and have them read um, our own work. And if you pick two or three interviews for, for to orient people, I would pick that interview as being one of the interviews. I think what made that interview work was, I mean, Peggy Priestley obviously brings, she's the one that makes it work. But I think also, as I recall, Donovan, um, who else was on the interview, Deborah? Well, it was Donovan. Um, Robert Smalls. Yeah, Robert Smalls. We had the opportunity, uh, Juanita, to do a good amount of background research beforehand. We were so lucky because the, the, that best-selling book about Peggy Priestley's ancestors had just come out. And so I remember on the plane, we, had, we didn't read the whole book, but we had a chance to read a couple chapters. Um, so that was very helpful. And as you, as you listen to the interview, you can hear us. Uh, we're not trying to brag, but we're trying to let her know that we know a little bit about her, her ancestors' history. Uh, she responds very well to that. Uh, we don't have the no, we don't like have the know it all. Oh, we already know this history, but we're like just trying to respect and acknowledge her ancestors. And I think that's part of the reason that that interview ended up working so well. Um, I, I think the same thing was true with the William Gould interview. Uh, a little bit of backstory on that. Deborah knows this, but uh, we we <laughs> we had Deborah the original audio. To that interview was saved, uh, but we lost the original video. Uh, so we actually re-recorded the interview later on. Then re really re-recorded. We did a follow-up, but I think we asked some of the same questions the second time around. And because, and this is another distinct thing about the Underground Railroad interviews that makes these interviews a little more challenging. And I'll just mention this: is that several of the people that we've interviewed. And also some of the people that we will be interviewing are themselves working on their family memoirs uh, and have a very and have been involved in this work for many years. And so it isn't like we're interviewing someone like, you know, like when I went and interviewed my dad about his military experience. Well, my dad is not planning to write a book about his, his life. Right. Um, and most of the people that we interview are not planning to write memoirs. Um, but in the Underground Railroad interviews, uh, many of the people are either writing their own memoirs or they're connected to a museum or a public history project or the National Park Service where they're doing this kind of work. And so that's one of the things that makes the interviews kind of unique uh, is that people are trying to give us more of a how would I say it, and more of an analytical perspective uh, on, on the interviews. Like, for example, William Gould talks about, you know, how he ends up being the, you know, President Clinton chooses him to be the chair of the National Labor Relations Board and how somehow William Gould IV, his concern with labor conditions is connected to his family's history. Um, that's pretty amazing. 
Um, it, it's, it's, and then when Wold himself is publishing his memoirs, actually Cornell uh, University Press will be publishing them, I think, in January. And so this makes these interviews a little more um, exciting, but I think in some ways a little more challenging because we're working with people who themselves are creating uh, historical narratives. Okay, and so that's that's a little bit of the tension I hear in some of the interviews as I as I listen to them and do the final edits. The last thing I'll mention is that that and I want to talk about the transcribing process. And again, I want to really commend and, and lift up the incredible transcribing work that you all have been doing. Uh, it has improved over time. Uh, I think in the beginning, uh, again, it was kind of challenging, especially in thinking about the annotations and the annotations I think have gotten, have gotten better, um, way better. In fact, I think now the annotations, um, I'm not gonna say anything critical about them because see, here's the thing, because we're in the middle of this project and we're immersed in it, we naturally take for granted uh, the knowledge that we're transcribing and editing and the National Park Service wanted us to make the interviews and the transcripts accessible to a general audience. And we just have to come to grips with the fact that most people know very little to nothing about the Underground Railroad. So I think that I, I really, that's why I like the details and annotations. Um, there's a lot of them now, right, uh, compared to how we first started. But again, I'm not going to 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 say do less of them. I'm just going to say continue to to think about parts of the interview uh, uh, that a, a general reader might see a name and they may not know who that person is. But that's a person who may have written a book like I remember early on, Ronan, we um, have several people mentioned William Still. And, and that's a book that people should read, uh, most definitely, because it was written, you know, contemporary in the 19th century. And so we wanted to make sure that a general reader would have a cue. Oh, William Grant still is a person who, you know, Robert Seeley's uh, ancestor knew. Uh, William Grant still is a person who's who helped uh, Peggy Priestley's, you know, ancestors to transition to, to freedom. Um, so I think the annotations are working are working quite well. Um, and then I promise the last thing I will mention before I just open it up is that uh, it's been this project has been challenging because we have uh, in part because we've worked with a few different generations now of National Park Service staff. Mm -hmm. And Deborah can attest to this because we worked with the staff back in 2012. And then when we received the grant uh, a couple years ago, there was another new cohort of, of folks. Uh, and then the last meeting that I sat in on, there's a whole new group of, of people, the National Park Service. So what this means is that you, and you already know the deal if you've been in on any of these meetings, what means is that expectations, even though there is a narrative, the original grant, and then it's addendum, uh, expectations just change when, when new people come in. Uh, so, but I think overall, we've been doing a really good job. Um, I think that getting the interviews um, kickstarted, this new round of them, uh, is very, very important. Um, and, and I think that uh, thinking about how you bring in um, new people who you want to have working on the project, traveling, transcribing, editing, uh, is very important. I would just say, you know, set up a um, kind of a uh, what's the term? I don't want to say boot camp because that has military connotations, but like like a training that's that's a common training to everyone. And we have enough material now where we can we can definitely do that. Uh, so those are the main com comments I wanted to make. Yeah, I, I I think calling it boot camp is fine, and this recording will probably be part of that. <laughs> um, and you definitely covered a lot of the things I want to ask about. Um, but I would one question I did think of is you know having looked at all these transcripts and done a lot of these interviews, what what is the best sort of question or type of question when it comes to 
asking these very knowledgeable people, but maybe trying to get something out of them that isn't something they've shared before or something that can like open up a, a new route in the conversation. What are your favorite kinds of questions? Hmm. Well, Rona, I think that, that that's a really good question. Um, I think I'd like the question, you know, Donovan for a while was asking a question about, you know, if you could, you know, if, 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 um, if one grant still, or if someone, you know, someone, one of the ancestors, if you had dinner with them, or if you met them in person, what would you say to them? Or what, uh, I'm sorry, what would you ask them? Um, that's a really fun question, which seems to be getting good responses. Um, I've listened to a few yeah, of those. Yeah, the interviews really love that question. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there's interesting, there'll be sometimes a pause and then someone will kind of think, and I can almost visualize them kind of sitting back mm -hmm. uh, and really kind of uh, going with that. Um, I like the questions that also, I guess there's a certain kind of question related to that, which is asking the narrator, you know, what about the meaning, you know, what is the meaning of their ancestors work in the Underground Railroad? Um, because that's so, because again, we're as historians and as people who, who even look at history, the bias is to try to shut off the subjective, you know, and to say, well, let's take a step back and, and, you know, what does this mean? But we have this unique opportunity to talk to people who do have a personal stake in this historical, in, in this amazing story, but they themselves weren't there necessarily at the time. And so I think um, asking people to provide, um, you know, to kind of fill in the details in terms of, you know, what does this history mean uh, is really valuable too. I think that some of the questions, Ronan, to just continue to respond to your question, where we're asking people details about the exact, um, uh, what's the term, the exact sequence of escape, for example. Um, those are good questions too. Um, but I think sometimes there might be a better way to think about posing that question because it seems like sometimes uh, one of us will ask, oh, can you explain you know, the sequence of, of how your ancestor escaped? What was their journey to freedom? And then we move away from that maybe a, a bit too quickly. Um, maybe there's other ways to kind of stay at that point or even return to it and say, let's see if we can get some more details. Not, not like, okay, at 1 p.m. Uh, uh, they did this, at 2 p.m. and that evening, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but maybe asking our, our narrator to talk a little more about what it meant for the, the, their ancestor at that point to to try to escape to freedom knowing what the costs would be and i guess this this gets back to your question um i think we need to be very clear with our readers uh and and this will sound this may sound a little over the top but we have to understand along and <laughs> there's a reason that tony morrison's beloved is probably the most banned book in florida because Toni Morrison, more than any other author in, 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 in our time, shares with us um, the meaning of freedom, but also the costs of freedom and what it costs to enslaved African-Americans to strike out for their freedom, but also what it would have cost them if they're caught, if they're freedom plan fails, which nine out of time, ten, nine out of 10 times, remember, it's going to fail. Um, and that's something I think that in the interviews we could do a better job in is helping to provide a little better context to say that, okay, your ancestor, you know, there's this amazing story, right? I mean, Peggy Priestley's, um, I mean, her ancestor's story just was a best-selling book. Well, that's exciting. It's thrilling. It's unusual, um, but you know, let's be real. It's it's um, it's not the normal escape story. The normal escape story is people is what happens 
in Toni Morrison's Beloved is people are caught, they're brutalized, they're, you know, they, their ears, ears or limbs are cut off. Um, and so trying to find a way, you know, without being too, too morbid, uh, if you will, of focusing on that moment of, of escape and how contingent, how, how difficult it was. I think that, um, you know, the term trauma comes to mind. Now, I just finished a college of education dissertation meeting where trauma, well, we talked about the uh, migrant mothers who were trying to escape from difficult situations in Mexico and the Caribbean and um, the, the, and how they, they're doubly traumatized first in the situations that they're facing um, with, with maybe with war, uh, so-called narco-terrorism, but also traumatized in these detention centers uh, in Texas and Arizona. And so I'm thinking it through about trauma in terms of the antebellum uh, African-American experience. And there might be ways with that, again, without necessarily being too over the top in um, sharing with the narrator how amazing it is that their ancestor actually did find freedom because it just wasn't that that that's not a normal outcome of that story of, of striking out for freedom again nine times out of ten you're going to be caught and you're going to suffer terrible consequences for being you know recaptured um so yeah sorry for that long-winded response no that was excellent i i wrote a lot of that down because that was um answered a lot of different points of that. I, I have two follow-ups that come to mind, and I, the first one is probably difficult to answer, but it's it's really difficult in some ways to for someone you just met doing these interviews to ask about trauma in that way and their ancestors' trauma or how that's carried on. So, you know, difficult to answer this question, but how? what are ways to ask about that delicately or make people more comfortable in sharing um, something like that. And I mean, I'm thinking of this as coming at this project as a white person who, you know, people might feel differently about sharing those kinds of uh, experiences with me as a interviewer. So if you have any thoughts on that? Well, I think that, um, I mean, one thought, Ronan, is not to pose that kind of question, or maybe is to pose that question, you know, later rather than earlier in the interview, or if you don't feel comfortable, you know, even maybe posing that question in a second interview. Now, this is one of the things I've noticed, I forgot to mention, the follow-up interviews that I've, I've read so far have worked really well. And it seems to me that there's some, and I, you know, participating in a few of those myself, um, I just recall that some of those more, um, tough questions sometimes get posed in the follow-up interview, which makes perfect sense because as you mentioned, there's a distance between the narrator and the interviewer. You know, there's differences of age, there's differences of race, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes that, I, so in other words, I wouldn't ask the, you know, the trauma question until you feel comfortable in, in, um, in asking it. Um, but I will say that some of our narrators have went there first, right? Have, have actually brought that issue to the forefront. And then that becomes a, a topic of conversation in the interview. And I, I think that's perfectly fine because that's kind of, you know, that's where the narrator kind of sets the, sets the tone. Yeah, that's great. I, I have more questions, but I'll open it up to everyone else uh, first. Yeah, and I, you know, feel free also, you know, as Deborah and I have been talking at least almost Deborah once a week on the phone, you know, you can always um, email or call with, with questions or, mm -hmm. or things that come up. Um, and I'm happy to continue looking at the interviews. I can't promise to be able to do um, final edits on a lot of them um, just because things have kind of, you know, getting busy here. But um, I, I think that the, these are so both unique, but also just so critical, mm -hmm. these interviews. I just can't, 
I mean, I know that there's a lot of great oral history projects going on now throughout the country, but I just think that this one is just premier uh, because mm -hmm. of what what we're going through now. Um, mm -hmm. Looking well, behind you know, the critical race theory this summer, yeah. <laughs> people, and when I mentioned this project, they just can't believe it. They're like, you know, I couldn't do something like that and where I'm at. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we can't take it for granted. Absolutely. I, I feel similarly about kind of how grateful it is. And I see we're coming up on almost 1 p.m. I, I know you said you'd have to go. So I want to say again, if uh, Juanita, Deborah, Anna, uh, if any of you have any questions, any last notes? I have a quick question. And thank you so much for doing this, Dr. Ortiz. I apologize for being off camera. I have, I'm down with COVID, so I'm a little bit yucky on my couch at home. <laughs> Um, but Ronan, it has more to do with the processing transcripts. So if you have a question about the process, I would say go for it. I mean, my my only lingering question was, uh, of course, we've read Bound for Canaan and you've talked about Toni Morrison's Beloved, but if there's any other like just one or two uh, reading recommendations for people coming in. Which... Yes, I mean, I yeah, William Grant Stills um, book should be required reading because he takes us through the mechanics. Um, I mean, obviously Philadelphia is, is one of many kind of freedom depots, if you will, but it's it's really one of the premier ones. And so I'd encourage folks. Um, and then also the narratives that we've talked about, I think that the Ilian Wu um, narrative uh, about the Kraft family is just, it's superbly written. Uh, it's a fun read. Um, and that book helps us grapple with how it takes time to piece together this family narrative um, and in some ways helps us in, in that, I think reading Wu's book in tandem with the Peggy Priestley interview, um, the return to Georgia to work as a civil rights activist, there's a, there's a certain way that that, that that narrative helps give meaning to like contemporary meaning now to the Underground Railroad uh, and and the crafts escape, you know, uh, in the antebellum time period. I think that uh, also, uh, Ronan and Anna. I think that the, um, you know, William Gould's uh, his, his William Gould the first his Civil War diary. Um, I think that should be required reading because that gives us a sense of again the contingency, the extraordinary moment in, in time. Um, obviously it's, it's about the civil war, uh, but I'm impressed by how many of our interviews, whether or not the ancestor escaped during the war, how many of the interviews actually refer reference the civil war and some even reconstruction. Now that's very striking. Um, and so I think that that, so again, I know this is being recorded, so I apologize. I'm a little fragmented, but I think the William Bull narrative I think the, the the more recent, the Wu book on the Crafts um, family, I mean, the audio book I've heard is really excellent too. You may want to read that in audio. Uh, it's really, um, I, I love, it's funny, as you get older, like I really appreciate, as I get older, I appreciate audio books because I like to travel with them sometimes. Um, the William Grant Still um, narrative, I yes, Toni Morrison, beloved, yes, if only because the state of Florida doesn't want you to read that book, read it. <laughs> it has so much history in it. Um, yeah. Thank you for those. Um, so I think my question is about any guidance or takeaways that you might have for us regarding the annotations on the transcript. I know that that process um, is something that Donovan and Adolfo have been working on, and it, it makes these transcripts even more rich uh, compared to other projects where, you know, we might not go through with an annotation process. But any takeaways or guidance or reflections um, that you can impart would be great, especially as we do welcome more folks into the project. Yeah. Well, and I think it's an excellent question. I think that trying out some of the annotations on, on students as they come in and, you know, not like you're trying to like catch them and what they know or do not know, but seeing if the annotations are working with our local general reading audience um, might, you know, might be a good kind of, because I think at this point, 
we're just trying to imagine what a general audience knows or does not know about African American history and the Underground Railroad. And, you know, even thinking about that first interview with, with Robert Seeley, you know, he's talking about the Dred Scott decision. Well, as a historian, I hope that, you know, a college sophomore would know what the Dred Scott decision, what it was, what it meant, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but that's not real. Um, the fact is you have to really um, kind of teach that, you have to offer it, you have to, to not take for granted what general readers know. And this is, and it's not being condescending, it's just being real to me. Uh, and so I think that, you know, maybe testing some of the annotations out, um, maybe even in the internship, Anna, you may find spaces to do this. Um, you know, ask, ask students, um, hey, does this work? Um, does this give you enough information to understand the interview? Um, what do you know? What do you not know about the Underground Railroad? I think that, you know, one of the things that the Park Service folks have have been frustrated about is not us, but really the fact that the popular understanding of the Underground Railroad in the United States so heavily hinges on a few heroic people, right? And the whole goal of this oral history project is to actually excavate, if you will, the broader history, uh, which doesn't necessarily intersect with, with Harriet Tubman or Abraham Lincoln or Frederick Douglass, but introduces us to a whole new cast of, of historical characters. Um, and that's why the annotations, I think, uh, that's the kind of work I see the annotations doing, Anna. And if they're doing that work, um, then I think they're, they're, they're right on. I think there's always going to be a little need for some fine tuning, but again, I this I, I apologize for this long winded response. But I would start, you know, I would start testing them out um, as people are coming into to, to the project or in the classroom, uh, or even sharing one or two with with you know Steve Knoll uh, or Jack Davis or someone and asking them, you know, hey, um, does this you know, does this kind of work for the students? Now, make sure that, make sure you don't say, oh, does this work for you, Dr. Noel? Make sure you ask them, hey, does this work for your students? Because if you ask a historian, they're going to hit you with a lot of verbiage, right? I think that's a great idea. I like that strategy a lot. Thank you. Yeah, the, these are, again, I just want to highlight just how amazing this, this collection is and this project and the, the work that uh, you're continuing on. And I, I think that the next step uh, is, is going to be, and Anna, this might be another answer to your question, um, is just finding ways to get it out there uh, and, and letting people read the, you know, both the transcripts, annotations, um, you know, listen to the interviews, you know, get people's thoughts. Um, I think it will greatly enrich the, the trajectory of the project. Um, I've talked to a couple of Park Service folks in different units, and they're hoping that this is really going to just continue and extend. Uh, and I think that, uh, but you have to start somewhere. And I think that we're, we're starting the foundation of it in, in such a way that it's, a, it's possible to imagine this really this kind of work continuing uh, into the future. Well, yeah, thanks everyone. I, I, I have to, I do have to yeah. zoom up, but, um, but thank, again, excellent work. It's so great to reconnect. Uh, like I said, call anytime. Uh, okay. Lovely uh, to, to, to reconnect. Uh, Anna, Can I mention one on. last thing before you go? <laughs> Uh, we've been, Ronan and I have been working on an, a style guide to kind of train incoming students who will work on the project. Can we send that to you so that you take a quick look at it and give us feedback on it? Oh, yes, please do. Be happy to take a look at it. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thank everyone. you for that. Have a wonderful day. Thank, Thank you so much, Dr. Thank Reyes. you, Dr. All right, we'll talk soon. Have a great day.